You know what today is? If, if last Sunday was Resurrection Sunday, what, what's today? What? The Sunday after. You have my spiritual gift of being a smart aleck. <clears throat> it's true. This is Thomas Sunday. This is Thomas Sunday. All right? What do I mean by that? Let's look at it and see. <clears throat> John chapter 20, verse number 19. You there? Say amen. If you're not there, look up on the screen. You'll get there in a second. Then the same day at evening when the first day of the week, now this is Resurrection Sunday when we're reading this right now, verse 19. When the doors were shut and the disciples assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Uh, that's not just a greeting, shalom, when he says peace. He is saying that the, that the place with the abiding with God, where everything is of the glory of God, it is an anointing of the hand of God, which produces, the best word that they could have to describe it, is the word that he says here, peace. <coughs> Sorry. Peace. <clears throat> the Lord may want me to preach, but I don't think he wants me to sing. But Mark, it's your fault. I couldn't help it. I won't give you too much credit. We'll say it was the Holy Spirit and your fault together. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> when he's saying peace, he is saying everything that is of God, I want for you. May it be upon you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad. That's an understatement. Would you all agree with that? What would you think if you were there in the room and all of a sudden Jesus is there? Bam. I think glad is an understatement. I, I would have been dancing on the ceiling. <clears throat> they were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So when he had said this, he breathed on them and, and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive uh, the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. I mean, how could they not? I know they're excited. They're, they're just like, you won't believe this. It was so wonderful. The Lord was here. We saw him. He said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of his nails, put my finger into the print of his nails, and put my hand <clears throat> into his side, I will not believe. Now, people give Thomas a hard time. But he was just honestly saying what he felt. Are y'all okay with just being honest? Does the Lord want us to be honest? He was just saying that there was something there that just wasn't, he just wasn't there at the place of belief yet. Verse 26, after eight days, now that was counting that day, so this would be the very next Sunday. Every time the Lord showed up, it was on the first day of the week. It was on Sunday. It was on the Lord's day. That's why we worship on Sunday. We worship not the Sabbath of the Old Covenant, but we worship the risen Savior of the new covenant. He said, Jesus, um, or after the eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said to them once again, peace to you. Then he turned and said to Thomas, I think when their eyes met, he must have smiled. Because our Lord just was a loving kind of guy. He smiles at Thomas and 
I believe Thomas's eyes were about that big. Y'all good with that? Wouldn't yours have been? But the Lord, just like it was when he met with Peter, he'd met with him loving. No sermons here. No critiquing, no criticism. Jesus came with who he was to meet Thomas where he was. That's mercy as well as grace. And I'm grateful that for every one of us, Jesus came with who he was and met us with who we were and completely fulfilled us at that place, in that moment, at that time, with all the goodness of God. Reach your finger here. Not you, Melba. I mean, the Lord's like, I know what you said. I wasn't in the room then, but I know what you said. He said, come here. See, you put your finger right there and he, look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Now hear this phrase. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now, the, let's put this in the, the, the proper grammatical look. Do not continuously be unbelieving, but continuously be believing. There are times that we're going to doubt. There are times that we're going to have questions. Are, are y'all okay with questions? But there's a difference when someone is continuously unbelieving, questioning, critiquing, criticizing, wondering. It's like, I wonder how I feel today. That's being, that's being led by your circumstances. That's being led by your emotions. That's been being led by how you feel right then. If you feel good, you're believing. If you don't feel good, the world is craving, is caving in underneath you. That's not a good way to live. Aren't you grateful that we stand upon the solid rock? And when the winds and the waves and the storms of life come, and my goodness, they do blow against us, don't they? We're not shaking. And the house that Christ has built on that solid rock will stand. But if you're building your life on the shifting sand, I, I, I believe, well, I don't know. I, I, I want to believe, but I, I have that place of just not there. You can be there. You can stand firm on the solid rock. You can. You can have that peace that's beyond understanding. You can have it on Monday as well as Sunday. You can have it at work as well as at home. You can have it when you're talking to someone else, just like you can when you're talking with Jesus. You can have it when you feel terrible, just like you can when you feel good. It really doesn't matter the circumstances or the feelings or the emotions or the hardships, because I live in a world that's falling apart. And if you hadn't figured it out, I'm kind of falling apart too. And, and I'm living in a world where everything is passing away. And one day I'm going to pass away too, but I'll never be more alive than that day. Because I have something that's beyond this world. I have something that's beyond sight. I have something that's beyond hope. I have an anchor. That's my hope. I have something that's beyond my finite mind. I believe in the infinite and the one who holds the infinite. I believe beyond the troubles of today. I believe in the sureness of the everlasting love that God holds for me today and tomorrow. He says there to him, Thomas answered and said to him, 
my Lord and my God. My Lord, my Master, as well as my Jehovah God. The God that is on the throne in heaven, who knows the hair on every head and all the earth, who knows every thought, who does not one time does the wind blow that he does not know about it. He knows what's under every rock. He knows what's around every corner. He knows every cell in my body. From the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, every fiber in between. And he's still good with it. He knows it all. He holds it all. He is the sovereign God, but he's also my master and my friend. Thomas may have seen him as the one who could heal the leper or the crippled or, or the downtrodden, but he also was a, he, he knew the, the powerful hand of God who could keep the seasons together, who could walk on water, but he also knew him as friend. Now he saw him as master. History tells us that Thomas would take up his ministry and go all the way to India sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and would be martyred for the faith. He was willing, listen to me now, are you listening? When he said that he gave his life to Christ, he, it was meant that he was willing to leave all and follow him. It was his joy, it was his privilege to follow Jesus. Guess what? I believe. Do you believe? I mean, should we believe? No matter what, as Christians, as the body of Christ, there's some things that we just need to believe. Amen? Amen. I believe. Do you believe? Yes. Say it. I believe. I believe. Real quickly, I want to share some things in the book of Colossians. Actually, I think that this paragraph is one of the most amazing theological statements in all of Scripture. I really do. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, the Bible says this, He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. I believe. Do you believe? Say, I believe. I believe. He is the firstborn over all creation. I believe. I believe. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and then on earth. I believe. Visible and invisible. I believe. Whether there are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, I mean every level of authority in heaven, in earth, He's over them all. I believe. All things were created through Him and for Him. I believe. He is the before all things. I believe. And in him all things consist. I believe. He is the head of the body, the church. I believe. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? That in all things he may have the preeminence. I believe. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. I believe. And by him, by Christ, he came to reconcile all things to Himself. I believe. I believe by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. I believe. I believe. By faith, I believe. I hold to these things. They are true to me. They direct me. They guide me. His Spirit lives within me. It keeps me. It puts a song in my heart. When the world is full of dreariness. Let me go back. I want to pick up before this. I just want you to think about these verses 
verse 13. It kind of brings it home. I begin before in verse 15, but listen to verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. That means He's rescued us from the power of darkness. Do you believe that? I believe. He's conveyed unto us the kingdom of the Son of His love. He's conveyed unto us the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I believe. In whom we have redemption. Through Christ, we are redeemed through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. This is my preamble. This is my constitution. This is my everything. Today I stand here as a preacher of the good news of Jesus Christ. I didn't come to tickle your ears. I didn't come to, to give you a, a sermon on how you can understand finances and become rich. I didn't tell you how that you could dress for success or how you could have great preeminence in the world. I have come here today to tell you that there is a Savior and His name is Jesus. He was sent by God for you to give you everything that God has held and sustained and He wants you to have it forever and ever. I live for that. I would die for that. His blood has cleansed me. His love has kept me. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. He has loved me with, with an everlasting love. He keeps me. He holds me. He caresses me. He encourages me. I love Jesus. And I believe in Him. The world may think that they're smart with their questions. The world may look down upon the believer and says, oh, he's a simpleton. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. But guess what? He found me. And he saved me. And he lives within me. And anytime I need him, like a little simple child, I can run and crawl up in his laps. And he'll put his arms of love around me. And I can hold to him. He may be the invisible God as far as this world is concerned. But he's alive and well and seen in my heart. Amen. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know what you're missing. 